NFL schedule is coming out tonight. It's Thursday, May 11th. I'm senior writer Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The NFL is doing things it has never done before. Here to take us inside this new world is our senior writer, Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Great to be back. So let's start with the day after Thanksgiving. Black Friday is getting its first ever NFL game. What's the story here? Well, Amazon uh, Prime Video so far is the biggest winner of the NFL schedule wars. It has landed the first ever Black Friday game. Uh, Last year's Thanksgiving game set a record for the most watched regular season game ever. And even better for Jeff Bezos, he's got Aaron Rodgers and the Jets playing Tua and the Miami Dolphins. So it's really a twofer for Amazon. Yeah, and I guess the the Jets now realize that they weren't just trading for Rodgers, they were trading for that game, because I don't think they'd be there without Rodgers. Yeah, I mean, Rodgers and the Jets are going to be media darlings this season. Uh, You know, the Jets have the longest postseason drought in North American sports history, but look for them to be on at least six nationally televised primetime games this season. Yeah, that, that'll be interesting. And Black Friday is probably early enough that if things get weird and like, you know, the whole Rogers thing is is looking bad, you're, we're probably still in the maybe the honeymoon period by Black Friday. I guess we'll see. And if I know Amazon, Owen, there's going to be some sort of shopping angle. I mean, there's going to be jerseys involved. So, I mean, look for Amazon to really blow this out. Oh, yeah. I bet you will be able to click on your screen to buy an Aaron Rodgers jersey on Black Friday while you're watching the game. Um, It's it's not just Black Friday, not the only uh, holiday they're trying to stake a claim to. Um, On the night before 2024, you will be able to watch two powerhouses, the Bengals versus the Chiefs. Yeah, it's it's a great rematch. It's the AFC Championship game rematch. You've got Patrick Mahomes the most uh, compelling player in the league against Joe Burrow, one of the most interesting. It's it's a great New Year's matchup. And then the next day on Christmas Day, Fox has another huge game, which is Eagles and Giants. So uh, it, it's going to be a, a virtual takeover of the holiday season by the NFL. Yeah, right. They're, they're not giving the NBA any, uh, any deference here in terms no. of that part of the year. Um, the NFL is also uh, going to be spending some quality time in Europe. So uh, what do we know about that? We've got five international games coming up, including Bill Belichick's The Hoodie's first international game. Now, I don't expect The Hoodie to be wearing lederhosen or eating bratwurst, but he will uh, take the Patriots over there to play the Colts in one of two games in Frankfurt, Germany. Yeah, and we also have three in London, two of which involve the Jacksonville Jaguars, who I guess are going to be spending a significant portion of their schedule uh, in London. Yeah, why don't we just call them the London Jaguars at this point? Uh, I mean, I I think what we're seeing here really long term is the beginning of an NFL European division. Uh, You know, the NFL wants to get to $25, $30 billion in revenues, and they kind of tapped out in the United States now that they're back in L.A. So the next step is international expansion. Yeah, I mean, when Goodell floated the idea of a European division, or at least a you know a couple European franchises, it sounded like one of these things that people say because it's fun to say, but it, it seems like they're actually pretty serious about it. And you know what? It, it's really getting embraced over there. I mean, everybody knows about London, but the real uh, story that's not talked about is how popular the NFL is in Germany. Germany, it is taking off. The fans love it. They love everything about the NFL. And that's why you're seeing uh, the NFL make a big push in Germany, because when they had the old NFL Europe, those games were some of the best attended in the whole continent. Yeah. And, you know, it's I think part of the secret sauce of the NFL is they have that short schedule, you know, 17 games, probably 18 soon enough. That only means you have to, you know, sell out nine home games. That's pretty doable. That's a lot more doable than 81 MLB games or 41 NHL games. Yeah, they have the perfect schedule. Every game is win or die. Uh, every game is a knockout game. Uh, you don't have those uh, dog games uh, that you see in the middle of the schedule. It's just a perfect TV sport. And and they're also brilliant marketers. I mean, have you ever seen a league slice the same piece of bologna so many different ways? I mean, only the NFL could take a schedule release and turn it into a national holiday. And then letting that little dribs and drabs of news and Good Morning America and the Today Show and NFL Network, it's hilarious. It really is. 
Yeah, I mean, can you, you really can't imagine another league like, you know, the NHL saying like, hey, guess what? You know, the Panthers are playing the Predators in, you know, whatever on Christmas Eve. Like, yeah, OK, great. That's like one more game of, you know, a zillion. Um, yeah, fascinating stuff. Anything else we should be watching out for, um, you know, just as as the strips and drabs comes out? I, I just think that there's a real bromance going on between Goodell and Bezos. Uh, The NFL uh, tends to uh, pick out a a network media partner as a favorite and they get, you know, the favorite treatment for a couple of years. And right now, the the favorite son or or favorite media partner of the NFL is definitely Prime Video. Yeah, absolutely. Mike McCarthy, thanks so much for your insights here. Thanks, Owen. Let's see what else is going on out there. Lionel Messi may or may not be following Cristiano Ronaldo to Saudi Arabia. If you haven't seen the reports, go ahead and guess right now how much he is being offered per year to play in Saudi Arabia. Would you believe $100 million per year? You shouldn't. That's way too low. That's not even Ronaldo money. Heck, Saudi Arabia will pay you more than that if you're really good at golf. No, if you're the consensus best player ever at the world's most popular sport, you can apparently earn something around $440 million per year. According to Spanish TV station El Chiringuito, he has accepted an offer at that price. Messi's father and agent Jorge has denied that he has any deal in place and is saying they will figure out his next move when he finishes his contract with Paris Saint-Germain in June. Maybe that's true, or maybe he's just saying that because you're not really supposed to have a deal with one team when you're still under contract with another. Messi is back with PSG after being suspended for missing training when he took an unsanctioned trip to, uh, let's see, where was that? Oh yeah, Saudi Arabia. Looking elsewhere, a billionaire in Orlando has a dream of bringing an MLB team there. Pat Williams is pitching a $1.7 billion ball arc that could be the site of an expansion team, or he's just throwing it out there if the Rays can't get a deal done in St. Petersburg, they could move to Orlando. Unlike the A's, the Rays seem to have a lot of positive momentum in their current city, but as we've seen with the A's, these things can change quickly. Williams was the founder of the Orlando Magic, and he's hoping to call this future team the Orlando Dreamers. He also wants $975 million in public funds. And finally, Arlington Heights officials are getting a better sense of what the Chicago Bears are proposing, and they are stressing that this whole process is still in the early stages, and it's going to take a long time. The Bears have applied for a permit to demolish the Arlington racetrack, which they purchased for $192 million last year. They eventually want to build a new stadium, plus housing, retail, practice fields, the works, at that site for around $5 billion. They're going to want public funds, whether that's up front or in the form of tax breaks, but some people in Arlington are wondering how much they should pay for something that they're probably going to get either way. Up next, I spoke to the founder and CEO of Sponsor United, Bob Lynch. Sponsorships are obviously a key piece of the puzzle when it comes to the business of operating a sports team, and in the last five or so years, the value of those deals has rocketed up, and we have seen the nature of these deals change in a lot of cases. We get into all of that and more right after this. Here's what's trending now. You can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. 33,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. Everything they need to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity. Whether your business generates millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, take advantage of this special financing offer of no payments or interest for six months at netsuite.com slash front office. That's netsuite.com slash front office. I'm joined now by Sponsor United founder and CEO, Bob Lynch. Welcome, Bob. Hey, thanks for having me, Owen. Yeah, yeah, great to have you on. I feel like the world of sports sponsorships is one where we we see these headlines, at least on my end, you know, we see, you know, this brand, this team, this this company, this league, and it sort of feels like, like we see those connections, those sponsorships happening all the time. And it can start to feel a bit like Mad Libs, where it's like, insert company name, insert team name, they come together. Um, So just to orient us a little bit here, um, if we could just, maybe let's start with like the the biggest brands, the biggest teams. Um, What are are the most valuable teams and leagues um, in your world and what makes them the most valuable? 
Yeah, the, I wish it was as easy as Mad Libs, by the way, from when I was selling sponsorships. Um, you know, the, the, the traditional leagues that we're all aware of tend to dominate in terms of total sponsorship dollars uh, in the big five, uh, starting with the NFL. They've kind of continued this run of, of uh, since, since I've been tracking it, since I've been in the league as, as sort of the, the premier league in terms of total sponsorship dollars that have been spent. And at the very top of that is, is the Dallas Cowboys, as you know, many people probably know. But I think when you look at sort of what some of the most successful teams are doing, they've really figured out a way to monetize so much more than what you and I would consider sort of your traditional marketing sponsorship assets as signs and stadiums, naming rights, the stuff that we are all aware of, to really integrating into business units, extending into the community, um, what the Dallas Cowboys have done with their training facility and how they sort of extend these partnerships. It's, it's quite comprehensive and diverse uh, in terms of what that looks like. And I think that's something that probably over the last 15 years or so, we've really seen an evolution of how these marketing partnerships are deriving value for brands in ways that uh, I certainly couldn't imagine. Yeah. And, and why don't we get into some specifics there? Because, yeah, I think people, you know, like they know the signs on the scoreboard. They know the like, you know, whatever Budweiser play of the game or something. What, what's the new stuff? Wi-Fi integration and Verizon, not necessarily something new as it relates to corporate partnerships, but again, about 10, 15 years ago, stadiums were just starting to even like have any sort of Wi-Fi connectivity for the for the fan experience. And today, if you look at that Super Bowl stadium, there were uh, for for every 38 people, there was a box that was delivering some sort of connectivity to them. And the costs that go into that and, and really the planning that goes behind that with, let's say, a Verizon and the stadium to make that happen is um, it's, it's quite intensive. Um, but here's the thing, like that's the easy one that you're seeing. Now you're starting to see these sort of integrations with a lot of different technology companies that are looking at stadiums and teams as sort of a jumping off point to both sort of be able to showcase their technologies also be able to create better fan experiences. So for the teams, it's quite valuable uh, to be able to show that as well. And then really using, using that as a B2B platform to, uh, to create these sort of relationships with their business ecosystems that these teams have too. One thing we've seen is that team values have been skyrocketing over the last say, five, 10 years. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, with media rights. But I'm wondering if a lot of the same factors of you know, relating to sports's sort of central presence in the media, especially as things get more fractured through streaming and cord cutting, are some of those same factors driving up sponsorship values as well? Yeah, media rights, certainly what everybody kind of always talks about as it relates to the value and, and for, for the right reasons. But once you kind of take out media rights, you look at the, the, the ecosystem of business that that's being generated from hospitality to merchandising, to obviously sponsorships to now gaming and betting, which we've seen a massive driver of sponsorship dollars, but also value in, in some of these organizations that might have the betting licenses. Uh, in the NFL alone, uh, sponsorship dollars increased 39% year over year in pretty much a mature industry. I mean, gaming's been around in sponsorships for a very long time, but now they're extracting new value related to that. Um, and so when you kind of look at, in, if you're looking to invest in a team, uh, by a team, just the diversification of revenue streams now is is really quite interesting. And then once you start to take uh, some of these other things that are being done around like real estate rights in and around the stadiums, let's say with the Jacksonville Jaguars and what they're starting to do to going back to all the way to Fenway Sports when they started doing that at Fenway Park, there's just a lot of value to extract from these investments beyond media rights these days. Are there lines in American sports that you think uh, haven't been crossed yet that might be I mean, i'm thinking of if you think of european soccer um the um la liga is not actually called la liga it's ea sports la liga and there's other you know examples like that there can be team names there can be you know like the entire league can have a, a naming sponsor um and we don't have anything quite like that in the u.s where it's like you know the sony nfl or something um but so are there lines that you think we might cross here in this country at some point? Yeah, I, I have an interesting take in that in Europe, 
they started on one end of the spectrum. They started with like slapping like logos on, on jerseys before anybody else did. They started naming their entire leagues. The other side in the US, they started with all the like integrated partnerships and now they're starting to work their way up. So they're actually both going in different directions where La Liga and European clubs are getting much more sophisticated with like true integration of partnerships versus just sort of having the name attached to their most valuable assets. On the, on the U.S. side, you're starting to see that now where they're getting more aggressive and realizing, hey, there's value to be derived from sort of like naming the entire uh, you know, league, let's say. Um, but I think the only difference I would say is that now with the value of social media and digital rights and the expansion of brand uh, exposure through other means other than just having to name, let's say, a league, I don't necessarily see it going to that, you know, far of a degree, but I actually see the European leagues not having to do that as much to actually start to generate significant revenues. And they have like one third of the number of corporate partnerships on average in the big five uh, European soccer leagues, like an average team versus an average professional sports team here in the U.S. So their opportunity is just brand expansion and category expansion, but leveraging other assets outside of like the the crown jewel of, you know, naming their entire league after a brand, essentially. Yeah, right. And we've, we've already seen some recent line crossing in the US with uh, with Jersey sponsorships. And we also have a bunch of sort of upstart leagues like the Premier Lacrosse League, Major League Rugby, Major League Cricket. What are you seeing, if anything, in those kind of lower down leagues? Is there interest there? Yeah, there's tremendous interest. There's this uh, sort of evolution that the sponsorship industry is going through now where you're having this massive expansion of platforms that brands and content gets distributed across where now brands aren't limited in terms of the number of options that they can sort of sponsor. If you look at like a professional sports team, it has massive amounts of fans, very, very diverse fans typically across their entire communities. Now, as you start to go sort of down market to, let's say, pickleball or lacrosse, you're finding these more passionate fans that are sort of highly vested in these particular leagues, or even things like women's sports, where the engagement levels are actually much, much higher. It just happens to be smaller audiences. But for the brands, they have more buying options now to start to diversify their dollars into these places and reach audiences. No different than, say, investing in advertising on one big website Versus, hey, we can sort of buy a network here of highly passionate people and then align our brand in different ways. So like Nationwide is a good example where, you know, they do the NFL honors with Walter Payton, but they work with the NWSL to do internship programs for the players. And so completely different strategies from community to directly impacting players. And it gives them basically an ecosystem to try things as well. Lower cost, lower uh, 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 point where they can kind of enter in and do deals and try very innovative things and then ultimately scale up in a professional sports or just scale out to more and more leagues that are just starting to emerge. And uh, you see this with like the Savannah uh, Bananas uh, and what they're doing in that space, which is such an anomaly. They won't take corporate partners, but they did do one, I believe, with Zappos where they wouldn't do a naming rights and it was loved by, I believe it was loved by Zappos was the whole thing. And they never did it, but they reinvented sort of the way they partner and Zappos did it in a completely different way uh, to bring sort of surprise and delight to their fans. And so those sort of leagues provide tremendous value to try different things that you couldn't do in maybe uh, sort of larger organizations that are a little bit more set in their ways. Yeah. Um, anytime we can bring in the Savannah Bananas, that's that's a win for me. Uh, Bob Lynch, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me, Owen. Thanks for listening. Hit the subscribe button wherever you are listening, which could be a lot of places at this point. We're on YouTube, we're on Audible, we're obviously on Apple, Spotify, Google. I personally use Overcast, which also happens to describe the weather where I am right now. Wherever you are, subscribe, rate and review, share the show with a friend. Thanks for listening and we will see you tomorrow.